as we last saw in our previous episode, with the arrival of General Savish's 3rd Australian Division, the drive to Salamaua was finally about to begin. Though the Allies had won two key victories at the Battle of Wau and the Bismarck Sea, they had wasted a perfect chance to attack the lightly defended Japanese bases of Ley and Salamaua, and now they have much fighting ahead of them before they can have the opportunity to expel the enemy from New Guinea in order to at last secure their homeland. In front of the brave and skilled Australian soldiers are the ferocious troops of the Japanese Empire, who hold two critical strongholds in the path of the Allies to victory, Mubo and the Bobdubi Ridge. Thus we are about to witness the beginning of another bloody campaign in the Pacific War, so join us as we delve into the start of the battles of Mubo and Bobdubi. We'd also like to ask a seemingly simple question, when did this war even start? 1941? 1939? How about 1931? We invite you to explore this question with our sponsor Magellan TV, the hidden gem of documentary streaming services who bring you Kenji Ishiwara, the man who triggered the war. This man, General Ishiwara, was a prime example of the sort of Japanese officer that the interwar period produced, and it was he and those like him who, it can be argued, started the war through the invasion and annexation of Manchuria in 1931. He believed in the inevitability and perhaps desirability of a total, final war to upend the global order. In particular, he was influenced by the militaristic notions growing in Germany, where he studied, and by the general perception that the West, specifically the Americans, were hurting Japan, especially after the Wall Street crash brought down the Japanese economy too. So it was that an often forgotten Ishiwara planned the world war in the name of his emperor, an emperor too powerless to have much say in the matter. In this documentary, you'll see how these plans came to be motivated and carried out, and how they began the overlooked opening of World War II across Asia. Everything we've been talking about in this series starts right here, so definitely check this one out. You can see this documentary, along with a massive selection of other great history picks, by using our month free trial of Magellan TV. Get started at our link in the description. When General Savige, with the headquarters of the 3rd Division, took command of the Walbalolo area, he inherited dispositions and the tactical situation from Brigadier Motten, who had been commanding the troops in this area since January. Motten had then decided not to drive the retreating Japanese forces out of Mubo, but to control the area by offensive patrolling forward from a line running between Guadagasal and Waipali, thus maintaining a threat to Salamaua without prejudicing his main role of protecting the approaches to Wau from Mubo. An interesting fact is that back in January, General Blamey had actually given Moten a forecast that he would have to threaten the approaches to Salamaua to draw the enemy away from Ley. Blamey's forecast would eventually become the basis of Operation Postern, the planned invasions of Ley and Nadzab. And although Moten was aware of these plans, Savic would be kept in the dark until June or later, in that regard, during the early stages of the campaign, Motten would continue to plan his next offensive steps, while Savige still studied his best defensive possibilities. Savige's first operation instruction on April 25th therefore instructed the 17th Brigade to prevent the Japanese from entering the Bololo Valley from the Mubo area, secure the mubo guadagasal waipali area, and gain control of the coastal area immediately south of the Bitoi River while the 2nd 3rd Independent Company was to prevent the Japanese from entering the Bololo Valley through the Misim area and secure the Misim Pilimung area as a base for raids towards Komiatum and Salamaua. Additionally, the 2nd 6th and 24th Battalions were to prevent the Japanese from entering the Bololo Valley through the Markham area, establish a close defense of the Bololo and Bulwer airfields, and patrol forward to the Markham River. We've already covered the movement of Major Wharf's 2nd 3rd Independent Company into the Misim area, from where they were to conduct a number of raids and ambushes over the key Japanese positions around Komiatum Hill and the Bobdubi Ridge. But in the meantime, the 2nd 7th Battalion of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Gwynne had been ordered to make and maintain contact with the enemy in the Bitoi Duali Nassau Bay area, patrolling to the coast if necessary. By the end of April, however, the 2nd 7th had a new mission, to clear the Japanese from the vicinity of Mubo. 
After much consideration, Morton finally approved a plan to attack Green Hill and the Pimple on April 22nd. Ordering Worf to harass enemy supplies or troop movements down the Mubo track as a diversion. On the morning of April 24th, after 20 minutes of air attacks by Boston aircraft, the limited offensive would commence with a two-pronged attack by a company of the 2nd 7th against the steep and precipitous Pimple, which was a natural fortress that could be held by a few good troops. As such, within 100 yards of the Pimple, the two columns would soon be pinned down by the enemy's machine guns in front. And despite launching an all-out assault late in the afternoon, the Australians would be unable to gain much ground. The following morning, as Savige and his headquarters arrived at Wau, three Bostons again strafed and bombed Green Hill, while a mountain battery fired on the Pimple. Yet the troops would still be unable to dislodge the enemy with their next attacks, and with the defenders reinforcing these positions, the offensive would finally be put to an end. Meanwhile, Major Worf had sent a strong patrol from Namling to follow the old graded bench-cut track and ambush the enemy at the junction between the Francisco River and the Burali Creek. As the ambush was successful, reporting 18 Japanese killed, another party was sent on April 28th towards the south. Yet the commandos would this time get ambushed by the Japanese at Goodview Junction, suffering many losses as a result. A vital consequence of this operation was that the Australians learnt that the Bob Dubby Ridge area was held very lightly by the enemy, something that eventually convinced Worf to send a second platoon to capture the northern part of the ridge on April 27th. By the end of April, Worf thus had two platoons spread over the Bob Dubby Ridge area, with his third platoon in reserve at Missim. But the most important result of these two limited attacks was that Brigadier Motten now came to the understanding that it was too costly to assault positions like the Pimple, which should be bypassed instead. But alas, the decision to continue to launch attacks against the Pimple now rested in the hands of General Savige. Furthermore, a patrol would find the Pimple unoccupied on April 28th, successfully observing the location of enemy weapon pits and machine gun positions before the Japanese returned in force. Colonel Gwyn deduced from this episode that the Japanese must have anticipated an airstrike at the usual time and withdrawn, returning when they realized that no strike was to be made. He therefore brought forward another company under Captain Leslie Tatterson for a renewed assault, planning to bomb the Pimple every day until May 2nd, when, instead of bombing the Pimple, the Allied aircraft would make deceptive passes over it dropping bombs on Green Hill well ahead of the attacking infantry in the hopes that the Japanese would vacate the pimple just like they had done before. Although shrewdly conceived, the plan would go astray, as the Japanese would not move back as they vacated the pimple, instead moving forward onto the southern slopes. Unable to break through, the Australians would be once again forced to withdraw. Worried about the situation, General Nakano had deemed it necessary to dampen the enemy's initial enthusiasm by sending two companies of the 115th Regiment to reinforce Mubo, also sending a battalion of the 102nd Regiment to occupy the Nassau Bay area. To Moten's relief, this second failure also convinced Savige that attacks should not be made against prepared enemy positions in circumstances under which heavy casualties would be incurred without commensurate results that such positions should be outflanked, neutralized and isolated from sources of supply and water, and that the enemy should be constantly harassed by raids, ambushes and fighting patrols. Despite this, another company attack, supported by aircraft and artillery, would be launched on May 7th, yet again trying to flank the enemy positions and yet again failing to do so because the defenders managed to pin the attackers down with machine gun and sniper fire. During these attacks on the Pimple, the 2nd 7th Battalion lost 12 killed and 25 wounded for no gain at all, and the situation was only going to get worse for the Australians there. Meanwhile, on May 3rd, the attack on the northern part of the Bob Duby Ridge finally began, as the recently arrived platoon headed towards New Bob Duby. The commandos found a strong enemy presence in the village, so they instead decided to head towards Old Bob Duby occupying the South Coconuts area by May 4th. Just behind, they set up a Vickers machine gun position, later known as Old Vickers, 
which allowed them to harass the enemy movements and to see as far as Selamawa, the mouth of the Francisco, and part of the track to Mubo. The Japanese quickly responded to this threat by sending some reinforcements to the area, successfully recapturing the South Coconuts with a counterattack on May 5th, though the commandos would continue to hold the old Vickers position. On this day, the Australians would also set up a Vickers near Guaybolom, which allowed them to fire on the Comiatum track from a long distance. The next day, a patrol managed to sneak through the Francisco River, finding the North Coconuts area unoccupied and successfully establishing a position there. With the enemy virtually surrounded, the commandos began a heavy bombardment of the Centre Coconuts on May 7th, forcing the Japanese to withdraw. The Australians rapidly took advantage of this to occupy the area, something that aroused the enemy, who counterattacked three times, but were driven back at each opportunity. Around midday, however, the Japanese would skillfully use their mortars to force the commandos to pull back. But on the following day, some 60 reinforcements from Salamaua would be ambushed by the North Coconuts Detachment, suffering the loss of 20 men. On May 9th, disaster finally struck the Mubo area, when a booby trap suddenly exploded in front of Captain Tatterson's defensive perimeter on the Jap track. Almost immediately, the Japanese opened fire on the Australians' right flank, and soon, this incursion would evolve into a strong attack, with the enemy starting to feel for weak spots. As the defenders realized that the Japanese were trying to encircle them, Colonel Gwyn would send a small force back along the track to keep it open. Though Tatterson's men resisted tenaciously, Japanese progress was slow and steady, and they would eventually manage to cut the track to the rear of the defenders. This left Tatterson's men completely isolated, and they would have to ferociously fight many defensive actions against the heavy and repeated assaults of the Japanese, who would also start to bring many reinforcements, a total of about 500 troops from the 102nd and 115th Regiment over the following days. Furthermore, the Japanese battalion stationed in the Nassau Bay area had been ordered to capture the high area on the right bank of the Buyawim River Fork, in coordination with the May 9th attack, something that would have endangered the Lababia camp position. But luckily for the Australians, rumours of Australian movement ahead left the Japanese commander undecided, and he would eventually decide to hold firmly the important points on the right bank of the Bitoy mouth instead. Meanwhile, Gwyn decided to concentrate his forces on the Lababia camp and began to send strong patrols to break the enemy ring, but to no avail, as the enemy was too strong. This finally forced Gwyn to signal Motten that one battalion was too small to carry out effectively the role assigned to the 2nd 7th. Thankfully, on March 11th, a company-sized relief force of 60 men would manage to break through and reach Tatterson where they learned that the Japanese had apparently withdrawn earlier that morning. Though the Japanese counterattack had ended, Gwyn now had to reorganize his forward positions in the light of all the lessons learned, with Tatterson's company occupying a position in depth on the Jap track, and with the relief force occupying the track junction and the Lababia camp. Furthermore, cleared fields of fire were developed, with trees of all sizes being felled, and section positions were sighted and given mutual fire support, fully dug with connecting crawl trenches. Irritated at the lack of progress, however, General Savige also ordered Motten to move his headquarters from the relative safety of Wau and forward into the Skindawai area. There, Motten decided that he would continue to use one infantry battalion forward, while one company from the 2nd 6th Battalion would move to Napier to secure control of the coastal area south of the Bitoy to Nassau Bay by raids. From May 15th onwards, the 17th Brigade would concentrate more on aggressive patrolling in all sectors than on actual attacks. Strong patrols daily harassed the Pimple, and on Observation Hill, constant patrolling combined with intelligent sighting of booby traps almost paralyzed movement by the Japanese outside their positions. Finally, on May 23rd, Savige would decide to relieve the spent 2nd 7th with the rested 2nd 6th Battalion. The forward move of the 2nd 6th, the same day in which the 15th Brigade headquarters and the 1st Company of the 58th 59th Battalion arrived at Wau. In the meantime, on May 11th, Worf's commandos found the entire Coconuts vacated and immediately moved in to occupy the area. 
Though extremely likely, the second third independent company now held the entire Bobjubi ridge, from the coconuts to Namling. Determined to make the most of the situation, Worf turned his attention to the Komiatum track, starting a long-range fire duel with the Japanese at the top of the hill. But realizing the importance of holding Bobjubi, the enemy was now better prepared and reinforced, boasting two heavy machine guns, a heavy mortar, and two mountain guns to wreak havoc on the Australian positions. The Japanese troops, now commanded by General Okabe, also became bolder after receiving many reinforcements in the past few days, and subsequently began to launch limited attacks against the commanders, getting repelled on May 12th and 13th. But on May 14th, after a heavy shelling of the Bobjubi Ridge positions, the Japanese launched a full-scale attack that overwhelmed the defenders and forced them to withdraw step by step to the South Coconuts area. Eventually, though General Nakano later criticized the morale and effectiveness of his troops, the Japanese would manage to overrun the old Vickers position, forcing the commandos to retreat into the flat ground south of New Bobjubi to cover the southern approaches to Worf's headquarters. With the enemy coming for him, Worf eventually decided that retention of his positions would cause heavy casualties, and that he would probably have to withdraw to the west, only maintaining his main position at Namling. Heavy fighting thus ensued until nightfall to gain enough time for the Australians to move all their valuable stores across the Francisco River, successfully completing the evacuation against the pressure of the enemy. The next morning, 20 Japanese dive bombers would also bomb and strafe the Bob Duby village, followed by more attacks in the next few hours, including one in error against the Japanese positions in the mouth of the Francisco, to the delight of the Australians. Although eventually forced to withdraw, Worf and his commandos had successfully managed to lure Japanese resources away from Mubo and Lei, inflicting many casualties on the enemy with his small, mobile and well-trained force. They also had much fighting ahead of them, as this was hardly the end of the battle for Bob Duby, but only the start. To support them, General Savage would also detach a company of the 24th Battalion to provide left flank protection for the 2nd 3rd Independent Company in the Hote Bagasu area. In response, General Nakano sent 170 soldiers to occupy Hote on May 19th, and soon they would start to exchange fire with the 25 Australians at Kisembo. The outnumbered defenders resisted fiercely, further inflicting over 50 casualties on the enemy, but they would eventually be forced to withdraw towards Ohibe. On May 22nd, the Australians would return to the Hote area, only to find it completely deserted, so they would immediately reoccupy their defensive positions there. Furthermore, in response to the Hote attack, Savish decided to send more reinforcements for Worf's forces. For the last days of the month, Worf would be ordered to reorganize and rest his force, with a view to more active operations in the future, aiming to lull the enemy on Bob Duby into a false sense of security. But that is it for this week, and in our next episode, we'll return to the forgotten North Pacific Theater to cover the start of another very important and bloody engagement, the Battle of Atu. If you don't want to miss any episodes, make sure to subscribe and press the bell button. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.